welcome to a new episode of A Flat Pack History of Sweden. I'm Elsa. And I'm Chris. This is episode 27, The Sons of Olof Rötkonung, where we'll be talking about just those two people, Arnold Jakob and Eamon den Gamla. The clue's in the name this time. Spoilers, this is the end of Erik Segorsel's little mini dynasty. Uh, so the end of this particular family ruling in Sweden. But before we get going with that story, we should say thank you to everyone who got in touch when it was our first anniversary. Yeah, uh, it's been really good to hear from people, everybody getting in touch, what bits they preferred or enjoyed the most from the last 26 odd episodes and yeah lots of people saying which Swedish phrase they enjoyed the most or the fact that they like them all in general. Yeah and we've had so many nice messages uh, lately in general and reviews we'll be reading some out uh, towards the end of this episode and yeah it's just lovely to hear from you because obviously when we do this it's Chris and I just on our own in a flat in Stockholm so it's very warming and reassuring to know that there are actually people on the other end who listen to this. Yeah, and thank you all for yeah, getting in touch, and we'll wait another year for the next anniversary episode. But how have you been since we recorded last time? <laughs> well, since we recorded last time was about an hour ago. So yeah, that's, that's... We recorded two episodes in a row today. Just, it's Sunday. We have quite a lot of time. So we recorded episode 26 that came out two weeks ago for our listeners. And now we're recording again. So uh, to answer your question, I've been good since we recorded the last episode. I had lunch. That was nice. Yeah, I'm disappointed we haven't had any new reviews in the, since we recorded last time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's because they haven't been released. It is confusing sometimes, and my mother likes to call me every time she's listened uh, to a new episode, and she says, I, I listened to the episode you just recorded, and I have to remind myself which one it is that she's been listening to. Yeah, because we're quite far ahead in time at the moment, aren't we? It's like we live in two parallel worlds. Yeah. But let's get on with this week. I uh, yeah. create more history of a flat pack history of Sweden by starting with this week's Swedish phrase, which is sort of not really a phrase, it's more of a thing. It's a concept. Yeah, so it's Freydags mis. That literally translates to English as Friday mis is a difficult word to cozy. translate. Friday cozy, Friday cuddles. Friday, yeah. Cozy Fridays. Cozy Fridays, yeah, that's probably the best mm. translation. But it's something you, it is, but it's also something like you you do or feel. Yeah. yeah. It's basically to have on Friday evenings that you have a bit of a, of a nice time with your family or maybe your friends if you live alone. You cook some nice food and yeah, just in general have a relaxed, cozy end to the working week yeah so yeah if you went to a club and stayed out till three o'clock that's not for a dog's news. no because that's that whilst that might be fun it's not that like cozy relaxed thing to yeah. do i would say freedog's news is first of all maybe you try and leave work a bit earlier uh sort of an established practice these days almost if you have an office type work in sweden i feel like a lot of people try to leave around four-ish, which is about an hour earlier than most offices close in Sweden. And then you head home and maybe if you've got kids, that means that you can collect them from nursery or daycare or um, wherever you keep your kids when you're at work. <laughs> uh, you can collect them a bit earlier. You have some more time with your kids and then you cook a nice dinner. Maybe you eat that dinner in front of the TV because this Fredagsmus has sort of translated into a commercial sense as well where I know that the major Swedish TV channels, they like to put on the sort of most family-friendly entertainment type shows. They're usually on on a Friday evening. 
So cool. stuff like Sweden's Got Talent, I think, is on on a Friday. <laughs> sure. Uh, and yeah, so then you have a nice, uh, nice time with uh, with your family. Maybe you've stopped by Systembolaget, which is the shop that sells alcohol in Sweden. Picked up a nice beer or a bottle of wine. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's funny because that's a very simple phrase, but it's actually one we talked about probably the, the most. <laughs> yeah. And so maybe if uh, some of our listeners who are not Swedish, you try this out, you you try out some some Fredags moose and uh, let us know how your Friday with Swedish Fredags moose went. Yeah, I think it's one of these things though, it's kind of everybody does it. It's just <laughs> that Sweden has a name for it. So yeah, moving on from uh, a Swedish way of life to see how many chilled out cozy Fridays Arnold Jakob and uh, Eamon the Gambler managed to have uh, in their time on this planet. I don't know if it was an established thing back in the <laughs> back in uh, the, the high high Middle, Middle Ages. Ages. Yeah. But we had a great introduction to this period last time around uh, when we examined the sort of things that would have been happening probably for more day-to-day -day people rather than the kings at this time. Uh, we've entered into what is sometimes called the High Middle Ages, as we mentioned, and for the next hundred years or so, historians have really struggled to create a decent, coherent picture of what was happening in Sweden at this time. As we mentioned in detail last time, unfortunately a lot of this focuses on the kings and rulers at the time, if they even managed to get mentioned at all, because there's uh, quite a lot of things. If you just literally go to like a list of Swedish kings on Wikipedia and click on each of the kings from this period after these two, lots of them say things like, we don't know anything about his reign, and that's sort of it. So, um, but this these two have a fair bit about them, hence why they're getting their own episode today. And we start off with a little bit of a controversy too, or what might have been controversial at the time, uh, so Olof Hötkörnung died around 1022, leaving a bit of a complex family situation behind. So with his mistress Edla, Olof had his illegitimate son Emund and his daughter Astrid, who was married to Olof II of Norway after running away to stop the war that we mentioned back in episode 23. Uh, there is also Holmfried, who we didn't really mention, who could even be a sister of Olof or a daughter, but who was married to a Norwegian noble. Astrid is still married to Olof II of Norway when we start this episode. So let's call that Olof Hötkelnung's first family situation. Oh, yeah, or his like part-time family, as it's the <laughs> illegitimate side. But, and then we have his second or legitimate family situation where he has a wife, a legitimate spouse, Queen Estrid of the Obotrites. And with her, he has two children, Arnund Jakob, who becomes king of Sweden after Olaf dies, and daughter Ingejärd, who is married to Jaroslav the Wise, who is the ruler down in Kiev. So it's a bit complicated, but not too difficult to get your head around. Luckily, uh, Ingejard can also be called Anna. Yeah, that confuses me though. Ingejard and Anna, are there are no similarities between those two names. No, I think that's the point, because <laughs> to, to make to make it easier for the Rus to say her name and for the, the people down in, in yeah. Russia and Ukraine, rather than keep going Ingejard in this Swedish name. I was, seeing that I have a very Swedish name as well. I have been asked sometimes if people are allowed to call me something else or if I have a sort of anglified English name and I always say no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Call um, me Elsa. Three letters. It's not that hard. As we mentioned previously, the succession isn't written down or formalized as a father to son thing at this point in Swedish history because of course the women are ignored. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not trying to ignore them, but unfortunately this is the case. Yes. So the kings were chosen as the most powerful or worthy person in the area, and so that it was called the elected monarchy, and this was almost always nobles, if we can call them nobles, uh, sons of kings or powerful warlords, and Arnon certainly gets a head start being the son of a successful king yeah. who's been around for so long. 
Just like Olaf Gretkonung and his father Eric Segersel, it appears that Arnold might have shared some of the ruling power in the last few years of Olaf's life as a father and son partnership, so to speak. Both Adam of Bremen, our amazing source, and the sagas mentioned that this might have been the mm. case. Uh, Snorri Sturluson, the writer of most of the interesting sagas that relate to Sweden at this point, even mentions that Jakob was actually Arnon's first name to begin with. But as the local powerful chieftains and quasi-nobles gathered at the thing or the court to elect him king, they disapproved of this non-Scandinavian Christian name, so gave him the name Arnund to use instead, as this was much more Swedish and would fit in with the context of him being king of Sweden. So hence his modern name, Arnund Jakob, is a combination of the two. Yeah. So it's a bit of the opposite of what happened to his sister then, who got it couldn't be called Ingejard and was called Anna. He has a not Scandinavian enough name with Jakob, and so gets a Swedish name, Arnund. Yeah, I didn't think about that. That's exactly right. Arnund has a reputation of being a tough, heavy-handed king, and as we'll see, he gets into a bit of bother. There is a law from the 1200s that Handley had a list of recent Swedish kings attached to it, and this names Arnund as Arnund Kolbrenna, or coal burner in English. This wasn't because he liked collecting coal to keep his house warm, though. No, it's because supposedly he was fond of burning down the houses of his opponents. Not very nice. But before you think that this is a bit harsh, it was actually a legitimate policing method, if we can call it that, in medieval Sweden. Uh, you could legally burn down the houses of people who opposed the authorities, sort of reminding them who was really in power. Luckily, the Swedish police force has uh, developed a bit since then and yeah. don't just go around setting people's houses on fire if they're caught. If you haven't paid your parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, burn your fire. Burn your house down. We'll come back to this law in question when we reach this annotated king's list, which is called the Vestergötland Lagen, or the Law of Vestergötland, in an episode when we reach the 1200s. Uh, the law in itself is also very interesting, as it's the oldest Swedish text written in Latin script, and is the oldest of all Swedish provincial laws. Yeah, we will definitely come back to it. But going back to Arnund, this Kolbrenna, Kolbrenna epithet is in stark contrast to what we heard Adam of Bremen describe Arnund as in his history of the time. We mentioned it in Olof Hötkönung's episode, but it's worth reminding ourselves of what Adam of Bremen said about Arnund. A youth in respect of age, but in wisdom and piety he excelled all who were before him nor was any of the kings as acceptable in the eyes of the Swedish people as Arnund. Now, Adam was, of course, writing after the event, so this might not just refer to his time as a youth, but in general record as king. It isn't entirely clear. And, as we know, Adam is writing, he's an archbishop, so he is likely to have quite a positive spin on Anun's performance as a king in general because basically Anun was good for Christianity in uh, Sweden. Christianity spreads even further in the time he is on the throne and Adam calls him the most Christian king of the Swedes in a later passage. In some ways, it can be seen that this really is a continuation of Olaf Hörkung's story, as Arnon seems to be quite like his father in several ways. He continues his father's work in regards to both Christianity and minting coins, and perhaps unsurprisingly, remains extremely active in Scandinavian politics, getting heavily involved with the Norwegians and the Danes as we progress through his story. One important thing to note is that Arnon continued the minting of coins in Sigtuna. He'll stop partway through his reign, but we still have plenty of examples of the coins around today to know that it was definitely a thing. Yeah, exactly why he stopped, though, is uncertain. Uh, maybe this is because there were too many coins in circulation. As we all know, you don't 
want too much money printed because that lowers the value of it. Because, as we mentioned in Ulof's episode, there might have been up to two million coins around. So either that or maybe because he didn't have the political power to keep doing so. Uh, something we'll touch on later. These coins that Arnold made included the same religious connotations that his father's coins had. And if anything, Arnold was even more Christian than his father. Because, of course, he was actually born a Christian or at least baptised when very young when compared to his father who only became a Christian when he was a, a king and an adult. According to Adam of Bremen, Christianity reached rather widely in the reign of Arnund. Missionary work led by Bishop Thurgot down in Skara in Vestergjotland continued until 1030. The year, not the time. Um, <laughs> he, stopped, he, he didn't work long days. No, he, got, well, he might have got up early yeah. and stopped at 1030. 1030, but, um, had enough. <laughs> yeah, it, it was in 1030 that Thurgot was nominally succeeded by a bishop called Gottskalk who was appointed by the Archbishop of Bremen, under whose domain Sweden remained. It seems like this Gottskalk wasn't really one for following the examples of priests like Ansgar, moving around the countryside and meeting his, his uh, local population, and instead he was quite a passive church leader who actually stayed at home in Germany. Um, <laughs> working from home in the high Middle Ages was probably a bit more difficult than today without Skype or Zoom or even texts to stay in touch with colleagues overseas. Yeah, I don't know quite how you managed to be a priest in Sweden whilst being in Germany. Uh, also, is it just me, or isn't the name Gottskalk? It sounds like he's a cheese. Yeah, it, yeah, it does sound like it might be a cheese. That's something you can have on your Fredasmus. You can have some wine and a slice of Gottskalk. Yeah. Luckily, though, since Gottskalk was busy sounding like a cheese and being in Germany, an English missionary called Siegfried filled the void to an extent. Uh, from a Norwegian base, he visited Sweden, Götaland, and all the islands beyond the northern land, which is a very not precise geographical uh, reference. He's quite likely to be the same priest who baptised Arnund when he travelled to Sweden during the reign of Olof Hötkonung, which is, is nice. Uh, he's still around. Perhaps they were even friends. We'll, we'll never know. However, Adam of Bremen also relates another story from the year 1030 about a priest who travels to Sweden. This priest is called Wolfred, and he travels to the thing of the Swedes, the court, that is, after converting many Swedes on his journey through the country. But however, he makes quite a bold decision to smash up an image of the god Thor with an axe during the meeting of the thing. And unsurprisingly, Adam of Bremen then says that forthwith he was pierced with a thousand wounds for such a daring act, and his soul was passed into heaven, earning a martyr's laurel. His body was mangled by the barbarians, and after being subjected to much mockery, was plunged into a swamp. Uh, that's not very nice, but also uh, he should really have expected that, smashing up an image of, of the god Thor is not very diplomatic. No, that's very much going into someone's house and criticising them uh, for their furniture or something in, in right in front of them. So it's really quite, yeah, very bold. There's one thing I don't quite understand. So they say that he, were, or Adam of Bremen rather, says that he was pierced with a thousand wounds and body to bar, so clearly dead. And after being subjected to much mockery, plunged into a swamp. So did they kill him first and then mock him? Yeah, then I think they're all standing over the body saying, you scoundrel, blah, blah, blah. Surely it's more effective to do that before the person's dead, though. They were probably, you know, so angry that they just wanted to stab him. Though. Yeah. I, I would say you mock someone first and well, then kill them. Yeah, I, I wouldn't tell that to the people because <laughs> then they would pierce you with a thousand wounds and then mock you. To... Yeah, yeah, I, I shouldn't get involved, really. Hmm. But either way, uh, the next piece of Arnon's story mainly involves political developments and perhaps inevitably some sort of fighting. So 
firstly, before we get to the more Scandinavian aspects, and also because it happens chronologically, mm -hmm. in 1024, the Russian primary chronicle that we mentioned a lot during the Rus episodes relates that a Varangian prince dressed in a golden cloak led an expedition to the Baltic Sea. Um, this prince provided military reinforcements to Yaroslav the Wise of Kiev in a battle against the city of Chernigov. From about this time in history, Chernigov was the home of the Grand Princes of Chernigov, whose rulers were quite often butting heads and being at odds with the rulers in Kiev, which resulted in a lot of conflict, this being one of the main early battles in this uh, rivalry between the two cities. And so this battle and expedition in 1024 is supposed to have taken place during a thunderstorm, which would be quite impressive to see, and ended in a defeat for the city of Kiev and the Varangian allies, and this Varangian prince retreated back across the sea. According to Gudmund Adelberth, a member of the Swedish Royal Cultural Academy, sort of a big uh, a royal society where historians and academics would gather in the 1800s, this Goodman says that he believes that this Varangian prince was identical and the same person as Arnund. This is because some copies of the Primary Chronicle call him Yarkun, which is a bit close to Yarkub. And alternatively, the name Yarkun could correspond to someone called Hawken, whom we know nothing about in this period. There isn't a Hawken that might fit this bill. Our copy of the Primary Chronicle calls this prince in the text Harkon, and also calls him Harkon the Blind, and we definitely don't have any examples of Arnund being blind. Yeah, this interpretation from the 1800s, it doesn't really hold water, but either way, the battle itself seems to have been quite dramatic, and whoever led it might have been from Sweden, or somewhere in Sweden, but it does seem quite unlikely that it would have been Arnund himself, seeing as there were other things going on at the same time that Arnund would have needed to be in Sweden for. Especially, like we said, when we were talking, when we date this to 2024, because Arnold had only just become king. The first proper dynastic succession of king to king in Sweden, if we count Olaf as the first king, mm -hmm. would he really spend a large chunk of time travelling all the way down to Kiev for this battle and potentially die in, in the effort? Yeah. Now, his sister was married to Yaroslav, who was asking for this help, so it, it could be quite possible that this Yarkun Hawk or whoever it was, was sent by Arnund, or at least given the blessing of Arnund to go. But would Arnund himself be the one? We don't really think so. This is even less likely to be the case when, yes, as also said, you take into account the local politics in Scandinavia at the time. Arnund is up to his neck in political dealings between the Norwegians and the Danes, just like his father was. I don't think it's very likely that he would have felt able enough or even wanted to go away for such a long time and leave Sweden open to much more scheming from their neighbours than was happening already. Absolutely, because as king, Arnund's political agenda, or his to-do list, uh, included maintaining the balance of power in Scandinavia. At the time of his accession, it worked quite well, at just maintaining status quo with a relatively even level of power for the three nations. However, as always, Denmark was looking to expand their influence. And to combat this, Onun's natural tendency was to support the Norwegian kings, Olav II, who's sometimes called Olav the Saint, and Magnus I. Uh, support them against Denmark and England's King Knut the Great during the 1020s and 1030s. Knut had been King of England from 1016, so was well entrenched in the British Isles and therefore had a great deal more resources than the Swedes and the Norwegians. 
And remember, at the point Arnon becomes king, his half-sister Astrid from uh, episode 18, Stories of Viking Women, and Olaf Rökholm's episode, is still the Queen of Norway at this point, married to Olaf II. So he has family ties to Norway and Kiev as well, and this is very much something that the Swedish kings at this point really seem to use to their advantage, and they want to have these relations between each other. Mm -hmm. And so... In 1025, a dispute flares up between Norway and Denmark because uh, Knut wanted to restore Danish control over Norway because remember in the last couple of episodes, Denmark and Norway have constantly been at war with each other about who is in control of the two countries. Knut was inspired when a number of Norwegian nobles and men of influence gradually started leaving Norway in protest over the rule from the Norwegian king Olaf as he took more control, more personal control over Norway and restricted the nobles' power. Or so they told Knut. Yeah, and to cut a long story short, this leads to war. On the way to war, there's lots of uh, chat uh, between the two kings of Denmark and Norway, and there's a weird reference to cabbages. They say um, to Knut, like, oh, maybe you're trying to grow your cabbages all over England, and then Knut replies something like, oh, but I'll come and take your cabbages, or it's, it's a very odd reference to cabbages. And this is all written down in uh, Heimskringla, one of the sagas. Yeah, so there's an entire saga on Olaf II of Norway because he was uh, such an important figure at this time. So if you want to read about cabbages, um, <laughs> read the Heimskringla. I'm starting to think, having read it, that cabbages were code for something. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it is odd, but onwards with the story. According to saga author Snorri Strulason, Knut tried to remove Arnun from the war by sending him lovely presents and offers of friendship, knowing that he had family ties to the Norwegian king, so would probably side with them. However, Knut's envoys returned to Denmark empty-handed, noting that Arnun replied rather coldly to this message and the presents, and not to expect any help from the Swedes. This was correct, there was, was a correct assumption, because as soon as Knut sailed to visit his kingdom in England, leaving his son, Hartner Knut, in charge of Denmark, Onund then travelled with more than 3,000 men to Kungahella on the Norwegian side of the Norwegian-Swedish border region in modern-day Bohuslän where he met Olaf for a friendly chat, something that Snorri Strulason calls a joyful meeting. Yep, sounds fun. They had a joyful meeting. They agreed to form an alliance against the Danish king. Olaf convinced Arnund that if Norway fell, Sweden would surely be next. So sometime later, when Knut was still away ruling from his English kingdom, Olaf attacked and ravaged Sjöland, the main island of Denmark, while Arnund came down from the east of Sweden with a fleet to attack Danish-held Skåne. Snorri says that this was what had been decided back in Kungahella at the joyful meeting. The Allies are combining their forces and going to Denmark, where they tried to force the Danes to submit to them as kings. And Snorri does say, however, that this was to be expected that the Danes would accept, like at least at face value, because the, they're exposed to harrying and find no support for making resistance. So because the Danish king is away, the Danes are going to say, OK, fine, you'll be our king. So, but just as a stalling action yeah. so, so they can just say that pretend it for a bit hope they go away and then Knut can come back there's quite a nice little bit of a poem where the skald Sigvat wrote according to Snorri Sturluson south over the sea sailed his dragons Olaf the earl's overlord mighty carry the king keel horses southwards with bellying sails to Hueland's plain Arnund, another army, brings up on great galleys against the Danish. Oh, that's pretty cool. Lots of Viking-y terms that yeah. don't, don't necessarily translate very well, but they're basically saying ship dragons sailed to Denmark. 
It was in Denmark where the two kings, they just waited for Knut, who eventually came back from England with a large fleet in 1026. And Snorri says that he had more than half again of the two combined fleets of his enemies. So King Knut was superior in numbers. On hearing of Knut's return with a fleet so large they couldn't beat him in open battle, the Swedish and Norwegian kings retreated back round to Skåne, pillaging some more as they went. That's not nice to hear. Don't like to hear that my native land was pillaged, but so it was. They eventually reached the river of Helge, Helge or that sort of roughly translates to Holy River uh, in northeastern Skåne, uh, actually by the modern day town of Kristianstad. It was here that a battle took place, although some modern historians think it might have been further up north, actually nearer to Sigtuna. Yeah, so we'll get into this a bit later on, but it's one of these things where Scandinavians l lack creativity of names. So there's quite a few holy rivers yeah. in Sweden at the time, so uh, we're not entirely sure which one it is. But the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle relates that this year King Knut went to Denmark with a fleet to the Holm by the Holy River, where against him there came Olof and Armund with a very large force both by land and sea from Sweden. There were very many men lost on the side of King Knut, both of Danish and English, and the Swedes had possession of the field of battle. So the sagas, however, say a lot more about this. Um, there's a lot of sneaky stuff going yeah. on. So knowing that they were outnumbered by this large Danish fleet, Olaf and Arnund decided to sail up the river and then dam it near oh. a large lake halfway up the river. Were they beavers? No, but they might have employed beavers um, to, to help them. Been inspired by beavers. Yes, and they spent several days chopping down trees and redirecting local streams and rivers to help create some marshes too. And then when Knut's navy entered the river and started sailing towards the Swedes and Danes, some of them started to go up on the beach and get their men out to try and attack from land. It was at that point when the Swedes and the Norwegians broke the dam in half, so a huge wave, like a tidal wave full of wood and trees and rocks, crashed down the river and smashed into the Danish navy and drowned some of these men who were just getting off the ships on the beaches. Oh. And... The ship suffered lots of damage, and many men on the riverbeds were drowned. Knut's flagship, a huge ship about 80 metres long, was carried along with the current out to sea. Uh, and that was where Arnon's fleet was waiting for them. So it was sort of like a double trap, yeah. uh, as Admiral Akbar would say. And the Swedes tried to attack Knut's flagship thinking it might have been uh, a bit vulnerable after being dragged down mm. the river by the flood but it was more of a floating fortress than a boat it had really high sides mm. and so if the other viking ships came alongside you could poke the boat itself but you couldn't actually get on board very easily so Knut's men were standing on top and throwing stuff down and eventually Knut's other ships came in to help defend their king. It was then that Olof and Arnon saw that, quote, they had won as great a victory as fate allowed for the time being, and pulled out, stern first, and got themselves clear of the ships of King Knut, so the fleets separated. Knut then rearranged his forces, and the Swedes and Norwegians saw that there were still so many Danish ships left that they would never win. So they sailed away. Knut did not immediately follow them as he had to deal with his damaged fleet and all the casualties. And Onun then tells Olaf that he wants to end the war. He says, As you know, King Olaf, this summer we all proceeded together and harried far and wide in Denmark. We acquired much booty but no land. During the summer, I had 350 ships, but now there only remain a hundred. Now it would seem to me that we cannot win much glory with a force no larger than this. Now I consider it most advisable to return to my kingdom. It is a good thing to drive home with all the cart in one piece. 
we have acquired wealth on this expedition and lost nothing. So there we have it. He sort of calls quits while he's ahead. Uh, he knows that he can't beat King Knut's much larger Danish forces. I like the phrase, it's a good thing to drive home with all the cart in one piece. That's yeah. A good, uh, that's almost the Swedish phrase of the week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we should perhaps try and sort of, uh, re-establish that as a phrase yeah. in the language. The result of the war are not clear either in the sources. It is obvious, however, that the Swedish-Norwegian attack failed to kill Knut or to take control of the battlefield and drive off the Danes. It seems like the Danes lost the most men, but ultimately perhaps they can be called the winners in some form. Although Knut seems to have been in quite a bad mood, quite annoyed after the battle, because there is then an incident where his most loyal and powerful nobleman beats him in a game of chess, and Knut's so angry he has the man stabbed to death in a church. Yeah, it's, it's a quite bizarre story where uh, this was the Earl who saved Knut uh, in the battle when his ship was surrounded by the Swedes, and he comes in and saves him, and then there's this... Yeah, he just he, they get really angry after beating him in a game of chess. So he originally asked some slaves to go and kill him, but he said, no, he's busy in the church, and so he goes and asks someone else to go and stab him um, to death. So yeah, Knut just kills his main trusted noble. Um, so he is in a bit of a bad mood. Yeah. But overall, the battle didn't really do any harm to Knut, as he remained master of Denmark and Norway still, and he was even so secure in this power that he even managed to go on a pilgrimage to Rome in 1027, so the, quite the opposite of Arnund not being able to go to Kiev because his kingdom would be in danger, Knut is able to go all the way to Rome. And in the year following the battle, Olaf II was actually overthrown from his Norwegian kingdom, and Knut was hailed as overlord in his stead. So Knut didn't even have to win a battle. The Norwegian people removed his enemy for him. It's also at this point where we reach a bit of confusion in what actually happened, because Knut also claims to be king over a large part of Sweden in these years. This has a lot to do with some lovely coins from Sigtuna. In the years following the battle, it seems that some coins were made in Sigtuna, minted in the great Swedish mint that's been there for a couple of decades now, in the name of Knut. And so this would imply that Knut was ruling over the area, or at least the town of Sigtuna, even though there's nothing mentioned in the sagas or any other mm -hmm. sources to suggest this. But the coin evidence itself suggests that at least the area around Lake Mälaren would have hailed Knut as their leader. The possibility of this brief Danish rule up in central Sweden has inspired much debate from historians and archaeologists. Uh, to summarise, on one hand, Knut's coins might simply be copied from the Anglo-Danish coinage in a mechanical way, but on the other hand, some experts have argued that the coins are too original in making to be considered mere copies. Whatever the case, it is certain that Onund was in power again in Sweden around the year 1030, so Knut's possible reign is likely to have been only a couple of years. I think this is edging into the territory that we're going to be talking about in future episodes because Sweden is still sort of a federation of these different areas of Sweden. So we'll see it with future kings, leaders are called king of Sweden, even if they're only actually in charge of various areas, for example, Vestergötland. So perhaps Arnund was still king of Vestergötland, but Knut had come in to take over part of eastern Sweden, so he could call himself part of Sweden legitimately, but also Arnon could still call himself King of Sweden because he had sort of the main area of Sweden as well. So it's, it's a bit complicated, but we are going to go into a bit of a deep dive about these coins because it is really fascinating. Absolutely. Now, for the following section, we really do have to thank Buga Eslund's very comprehensive article in the subject. It is in Swedish, but it is called Knut den stora och svea riket slaget vid helge å i en ny belysning. 
or in English that would be Knut the Great and Sweden, the Battle of Helge River in a new light. The main piece of evidence for this is, on the face of it, quite compelling. There are 30 coins supposedly minted by Knut in Sigtuna. Of these, 11 have Knut Rex SV written on them, or Knut King of Sweden or the Swedes. We will now quote a small section from Gräslund's article translated to English by us, of course. Only one of these 30 coins has been found in the southwest in Lübeck, uh, which is now modern-day Germany. One is from Erland, and all the others have a defined northeast or northernly spread in Trondheim, Dalarna, or Finland, where they are found, as well as East Sweden. They were mostly found in the north of Scandinavia, which strengthens the assumption that they were actually made in Sigtuna. Knut's Sigtuna coins must be viewed as a source of the first class. Minting is not dependent on other written sources. These coins must be seen as a defining argument for the fact that Knut, for some time after the battle, owned or had a political supremacy over the area of central and eastern Sweden. Knut's Sigtuna coin making should therefore be seen as a confirmation of the claims that Knut made in other areas of his realm to be seen as ruler over at least one part of the Svea kingdom. Yes, this really is fascinating. In the spring of 1027, Knut titled himself king, quote, over a part of the Svea. As a matter of fact, it includes as the historian Kurt Webel noted, the title King of Svea, Rex Svenurum, or Regi Svenurum, which is found in Knut's laws in the time after 1026. Gerslund believes that the total information about Knut's coin making in Sigtuna gives what he calls overwhelming evidence that it really was carried out in Sigtuna on the order of Knut. Now, this is why some historians therefore question the traditional location of the battle of Helge to Skåne that we mentioned before that it was near Kristianstad as it may have been in the Lake Mälaren area closer to Sigtuna so Knut would not have to go far to mint his coins. As coins are legitimate physical artifacts and the placing of the battle is mainly determined from literary sources and is therefore much more sketchy, these historians think that this might mean that the battle was in fact closer to Sigtuna. Yeah, so regardless of the actual location of the battle, there are some more technical details surrounding why these coins should be believed and used in this way. It does go into quite a bit of detail, but I found it really interesting, and it's something yeah. where you learn a lot about how society was run at the time uh, by looking into some of this stuff. So coin experts have determined that the backside of these coins must have been made by the same stamp in the minting process with four different stamps being used to make the front sides. In this time period, as we saw from Olaf Rödkunung's episode, coin makers also like to include their names on the coins they made for the kings as a little signature. And on all of the Knut Rex SV coins that have been found, the name Thormod is included in the stamps as the name of the main minter. Adding to this, there are some 20 coins with Knut's name where the text on the back also mentions Sigtuna as the minting place. And on all of Knut's coins, where it's possible to read the name of who minted them, it's always the same name, this Thurmond chap. There's also one coin where Knut is titled as King of Norway and one as King of England, and both of these coins have the location of Sigtuna as the maker location, but with different coin makers. A historian called Lagerquist agrees with Gressland, saying that some of the more common theories used to denounce these Knut coins, mainly that they might be copies, aren't really plausible. 
he points out that these coins don't show a single trace of the text mistakes that usually happen when people in other countries try to copy foreign coins because they don't have the same stamps mm. or uh, the same techniques so there's usually sort of like a telltale sign that shows that they're actually copies and he also noted that the overwhelming majority of Knut's Sigtuna coins have this Thurmod name on them which is not only unknown on any coins made in Denmark or England but it's also, this is the key point, Thermod is also the name of the coin maker in Sigtuna who produced Arnon's coins before Knut. So this would imply that Thormund is the master coin maker in Sigtuna and he either stayed around to help make Knut's coins or they just simply took over his stamp that he'd made previously. Yeah, the fact that Thormod made coins before Knut arrived does seem to be quite conclusive evidence once you add it to the rest. Logokvist also points out that one Onund and one Knut Rex SV coin appear to have been made using the same backside stamp. As a numismatist, uh, which is someone who studies coins, Logokvist is of the opinion that the conclusion is clear. Knut had at some point between 1028 and the beginning of the 1030s made coins at Sigtuna. His conclusion has been backed up by other leading numismatists, including Britta Malmor and Michael Dolly. Now, when it comes to having control over the minting process, it is quite possible that it did not demand any real effort from Knut. Arnund already had a fully operational mint, so the only real thing Knut had to do to make his Knut Rex SV coins was to order the making of a new stamp. As we can see from at least one example, the backside could be made with already existing stamps from Arnund's coins, which therefore came to carry the name of Arnund's coin maker Thormod. Yeah, so uh, as we just said, Thormund himself might not have necessarily been responsible, but it was simply easier and cheaper to use the same stamps from the mint inventory. But either way, this explains the stamp connection between the Arnund coins and the Knut coins. So if we can take this as red, why would Knut make his coins in Sigtuna, apart from the ease and the convenience? Well, Gresland says that Knut's coin making in Sigtuna should be seen as a political power demonstration and for this purpose, silver was used. As is known, Knut was not without experience when it came to economically taxing defeated opponents, as he did in England yeah. when he invaded England. Therefore, it must have been easy for Knut to tax the defeated silver-rich Swedish leaders and locals through taxes in both the form of coins made and general silver. So a bit of a Dane gold, mm. if you like. One can even ask if such a silver tax was a prerequisite for Knut's ability to make coins in Sigtuna. So what he means is that Knut might have collected a Danegeld type of levy from the Swedes, taken their silver and melted it down in the form of his own Knut Rex SV coins. That's quite a slap in the face, really. Taking your silver and using it to make political propaganda against you. Unfortunately, there is no literary evidence for why or how Knut came to take over this area of Sweden for a short time, nor about why he left. But we know he was increasingly trying to expand his territory. On his return trip from Rome, he writes a long letter where he calls himself king of all England and Denmark and the Norwegians and some of the Swedes, which I find quite kind of like, I'm king of all of this and a bit of this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why he left Sweden might be explained by his attempts to further consolidate his power in Norway. In 1028, he sailed for Norway, probably a greater price at this point than the slowly growing Swedish kingdom. So Ulof over in Norway is essentially unable to resist him, especially as some disgruntled Norwegian nobles support Knut's invasion. 
Yeah, so this is when Olaf is driven into exile, where he actually went to stay with the Rus down in Kiev. And on the way, he supposedly stayed for a while in Nerka, a Swedish province in the middle of Anna's traditional heartlands. And when he was there, he supposedly baptised many locals, because he was known as this great Christian king. And Knut had a fair bit of trouble trying to maintain and grow his power in Norway. This might mean he had to take troops or political power or alliances away from his small holding in Sweden and move them to help consolidate his control in Norway. So in 1029, Knut's puppet regent in Norway, Jarl Harkon Eriksson, was actually lost at sea in a sea accident. Um, so Knut's control was actually probably quite weak, as Olaf uses this opportunity to try and win back his throne. It's here that we can assume that this was maybe the catalyst for uh, Knut losing control of Sweden because he needed to concentrate on keeping Norway, which was much more important, more rich, yeah. had closer ties with Denmark and everything rather than trying to hold this little small Swedish kingdom yeah. that doesn't really have much. And... and it also makes geographical sense for Knut to focus on Norway because if you look at the map, he has Denmark, he has England then you want to hold Norway because that's all sort of around the same area. You don't want to focus on Sweden, which faces the other way. Yeah, you've got to go all the way around to Sweden just to get to the nice places in Sigtuna. So it's, it's much quicker to go up to Oslo or anywhere else in Norway yeah. than it is to go to Sweden. Um, Better skiing as well. Yeah. Um, and we can also assume that Arnold is back in control of Sweden at this point in 1029 because he provided Olaf with a force of 400 skilled men, according to the sagas. And Adam of Bremen says that he allowed Olaf to recruit as many men as possible from his realm, a number which he calls innumerable. The next part of Olaf's story is dramatic. So we encourage you to read St. Olaf's saga if you want the full detail, but in brief, Arnon's man doesn't get a chance to help Olaf as he is killed in the Battle of Stiklestad in 1030 against some Norwegian peasants who really don't want him to return to the Norwegian throne. Yeah, this is one of the big famous battles of uh, Viking history, so yeah, definitely read the sagas if uh, you want to find out more. Yeah, five years later, Olaf's son, Magnus, comes over to Sigtuna from Kiev and met with his stepmother and Olaf's widow, Astrid, who's Arnun's sister. According to the saga, which is supported by contemporary skaldic verse, Astrid spoke to Arnund on Magnus' behalf at the thing. This seems to have convinced Arnund to help Magnus get revenge, because a large group of Swedish warriors gather there and promise to fight for Magnus, who invaded Norway via Sweden in 1035. To cut a long story short again, uh, this time it was a great success and Magnus was crowned as King Magnus I, later to become known as Magnus the Good. Yeah, so this is a lot of stuff that Sweden isn't getting involved in necessarily directly, but it's a result of them being mm. in the neighbourhood. And Arnold is trying to give a bit of help, but eventually, uh, yeah, it's it, the main action is happening with other people, so that's why we're not covering it in too much depth at the moment. But overall, Magnus being back in charge in Norway is good news for Arnold, as it's his son-in-law who's now in charge of Norway, and Denmark's direct influence is removed from the kingdom once again. It's really a bit of a backwards and forwards for Norway and Denmark in the last 80 years <laughs> or so. Even better for the Norwegians and Swedes is the fact that Knut dies in the same year, this being 1035. Yeah, this is really now a bit of a role reversal. It really does leave Arnund as a bit of a godfather type figure in Scandinavia now that Knut is dead. Uh, he's by far the longest ruling king now, having been on the throne for 13 years or so, and he has these alliances and family members ruling in various parts of the world. Fortunately for the Norwegians and the Swedes, King Knut's sons really don't live up to the great part of their father's name. In fact, when the last of these sons, Hathna Knut, he dies only seven years later in 1042, 
Magnus the Good actually inherits Denmark as well. So that's a bit of a turn of events. It is then that Arnund gets a bit cynical in terms of his relationships and alliances. He falls back on the classic Swedish policy of the time, that being trying to maintain his Nordic power balance. If the king of Denmark ruling Norway was bad, concentrating too much power in one person that would logically mean that the same applies if the Norwegian king is ruling over Denmark. Yeah, absolutely. And Arnon can definitely be seen as a bit of a realist, both in the regular sense and the political science term as well, I think, when you look at this period. Because as a result, Arnon's agenda and approach to Magnus changes overnight. And Arnon actually starts keeping Knut's nephew, someone called Sven Estridsson, as a bit of a protege and even goes as far as to support his claims to take back the Danish throne from the Norwegians. So, yeah, he really is this godfather type figure. Um, but unfortunately for both Arnund and Sven, it does become a bit like a political game of whack-a-mole because there are so many attempts to get Sven back in charge of Denmark, but Magnus beats them back each and every time with the help of uh, Magnus's brother. And each time he loses, Sven runs back to hide in Sweden with Arnund. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's a bit of an ongoing cycle now. There isn't a real out-and-out -out combat between Sweden and Norway in this time, or at least not that anyone has been bothered to note down, so it does seem to be a bit of a proxy war that Arnon is orchestrating here. Uh, this goes on for quite a while, as it remains the case until 1047, when it finally pays off, because Magnus dies in 1047 and leaves Norway to his uncle, Harald Hardrada, the famous Viking warrior king. We finally got there. And also such a great name. I love the name. His Harald Hörfagre in Swedish and Harald Hardrada in English. Just great name. Perhaps a bit surprisingly, Sven's claim to the Danish throne was acknowledged. Perhaps the Norwegians were just fed up with all the insurrections. Uh, but their attempt to head off any war by giving Sven what he wanted, well, it didn't work. No, this is because a new war starts between Sven and Harald, where Arnold Jakob seems to have continued supporting Sven. The struggle was actually still ongoing when Arnold died. Uh, in fact, Adam of Bremen said that there was war between Sven and Harold for as long as they lived. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, but um, yeah, die Arnold does in 1050, having reigned for over 25 years at this point. So we can see overall... He achieved his goal of protecting his kingdom during this very turbulent time, apart from a somewhat unclear brief period where Knut has some power over bits of Sweden following the Battle of Helgeor. The Hervorar saga from the 13th century concludes with a chronicle of the Swedish kings which briefly mentions Arnund's reign, and it says... King Olaf the Swede had a son called Arnund who succeeded him. He died in his bed, and in his day fell Olaf the Saint at Stiklestad. Olaf the Swede had another son called Eamund who came to the throne after his brother. Yes, because now there's a bit of bonus content, shall we say. Uh, the second son of Olaf Hrötkonung, Arnund's half-brother, Eamund takes over. Now, this is the same guy, and this cannot be pointed out enough, that this is the same guy who, remember back in Olaf Fjötkonung's episode, had the epithet slimme, meaning slimy. Yeah, but unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for him, um, people like Adam of Bremen calls him the old. Oh, that's uh, boring. Boring, yeah. Also, apparently, as we found out in that episode, slimy didn't really mean what it means today. It m more sort of meant just bad yeah. or unable to do stuff. Yeah, and, and people do call him that as well, uh, the bad. Um, sometimes Adam of Bremen calls him that too. So 
this is already we're coming to up to about the length of a regular episode but fortunately or perhaps unfortunately there isn't as much drama in Eamon's reign so he isn't really worthy of a whole episode on his own and we can cover it now. Spoilers, uh, this fact of not having too much to say will remain the case for the next 80 years or so so we have quite a few kings who don't have much of an impact so expect more of multi-king episodes in the near future yes um but before we move on to Eamon eagle-eared listeners will notice we haven't mentioned any wife or children mm -hmm. for Arnund during his life and that's because there is no mention of a son and only a, a dubious reference to what people call a possible wife according to Adam of Bremen Arnund was married to a Gunhild who might previously have been the wife of Sven in Denmark but that doesn't necessarily really make sense um Adam doesn't mention any children in his history, but a later chronicler, one we've mentioned previously, Saxo Grammaticus, in his History of the Kings of Denmark, says that Sven's wife Gida was the daughter of a Swedish king. So that, by extension, might have been Arnund. Unfortunately for Gida, if she existed at all, this was a time dominated by men, so this potential daughter definitely didn't get a chance to become queen of Sweden or to rule. Instead, the crown went to Emund, Arnund's older illegitimate brother. Emund's mother was the co-wife or mistress, Edla, uh, who had a relationship with Olof Hötkonung. Emund had two sisters, Astrid, that we've already talked about a lot, and Holmfried. And Emund then has his half-siblings, Arnund and Ingiad. As we've mentioned a lot, Sweden wasn't a hereditary monarchy at this time by default, but by being the brother of the king and the son of a previous king, Emun would presumably have had a lot of political power leading him to be chosen as the next king, despite technically being illegitimate, slimy and bad. Yeah, and old. <laughs> yeah, but this form of choosing the king may actually have helped Eamund, as we see a lot of illegitimate but powerful children in places like England who aren't getting the chance to become king in the written down rule of hereditary dynastical succession so maybe Edmund was a bit lucky he was an illegitimate son living in Sweden and not in England yeah. because he's not excluded from this process in Sweden one point of clarification in case you end up reading all of the sagas or know them all very well Snorri relates that Edmund was ruling in Sigtuna back in 1035 but all the other sources show that Arnund was still alive back then and the names Arnund and Emund could quite have easily been mixed up as they are very similar. So, um, yes, there is the suggestion that Emund might have been in power a lot earlier, but nothing else seems to back that up. According to Snorri Sturluson, Estrid, Olaf Hrökonung's wife, was quite ill-tempered when she was uh, the wife and queen of Sweden. And she apparently treated Eowund and her other stepchildren quite poorly. And so poorly, in fact, that King Olaf sent Eowund to be raised with his mother's Slavic family outside of Sweden. And while staying there, he supposedly relapsed from his uh, Christian upbringing and went back to being a big pagan again. Yeah. Like in a lot of the recent episodes, our only near contemporary source for Eamon's reign is Adam of Bremen. Again, perhaps unsurprisingly, being an archbishop, he gives us quite a bad picture of this new king. This is mainly because of the attitude that Eamon had to the church and their hierarchy and chain of command. In particular, he didn't like archbishops of Bremen. Which obviously means that when then an Archbishop of Bremen writes about him, he's not going to write very nice things. Adam also mentions that Eamond was baptised but didn't really care that much about Christianity. He also gives Eamond the epithet pessimus, which means worst, 
which is also later copied by the West Gothic law, which uses the Swedish term we love so much, den slimme, the slimy. The West Gothic law adds that Emund ended up being quite disagreeable if you ended up trying to get in his way of achieving something. Eamon's main contribution to history is this conflict he has with the Archbishop of Bremen. It starts with Eamon's insistence on supporting and employing sort of almost a private bishop called Osmundus. And Osmundus learnt his craft from the Norwegian-based priest Siegfried, who we mentioned in uh, Arnon's life story earlier in the episode. Osmundus had been taught at a school back in Bremen and learnt his priestly Christian ways from them, but he'd actually then failed to be ordained as a bishop by the Pope. He didn't get approved as sort of passing his final oh, test. No. Yeah, can you imagine failing Pope school or the Pope <laughs> school of Christianity? You got an F. <laughs> yeah, well, then it's understandable why Adam of Bremen isn't too fond of him and f doesn't like that Eamond employs him. Osmundus actually gets into the church in sort of like a sneaky back doorway because even though it's legitimate and it's correct, it's not really the proper way of doing it because he gets ordained by the Polish archbishop of a place called Gneisno. This is a bit sneaky because it's usually the Pope that's supposed to do it, even yep. though the Archbishop had power to do it. They normally sort of, you know, let the Pope create their new bishops. So Osmundus took this power from the Archbishop of Poland and travelled to Sweden, where he managed to impress King Eamund. And in the mid-1050s, the Archbishop of Bremen was due to send new priests to Sweden, headed by a guy called Adolvard the Elder, who was supposed to take up his new job as the bishop at Skara, replacing Gottskalk, the Zoom-based bishop back in Germany. The cheese named Zoom-based priest. Yes, and so this delegation from Bremen arrive in Sigtuna and in Sweden, and they meet Osmundus, who is apparently wearing the clothing of an archbishop. Well, imagine that. You're coming in to be the new bishop, and there's already an archbishop, and you're like, I'm here to do the job of a bishop, but I'm already the archbishop. What are you doing here? Yeah, so Osmundus has proclaimed himself archbishop, wandering around wearing archbishop clothes, being the surprise archbishop. And so what's even worse for Adam Bremen is that Osmundus had seduced the still recently converted wild peoples through incorrect education in our faith. So he's teaching them incorrect versions of Christianity, apparently. Uh, what, uh, what could that be, incorrect versions of Christianity? Well, as we know, there's lots of internal debate in the church at this time, so maybe it's something to do with the, you know, the status of Jesus and God and all this kind of thing. But we, unfortunately, we don't know what he was teaching them. But not only is Osmond is pretending to be this archbishop, he's also teaching Christianity wrong. So, um, <laughs> regardless, Eamund turns back these envoys to Bremen, apparently being encouraged by Osmundus, because that would make sense. He doesn't want to lose his job as being a fake archbishop. But a local powerful Swedish politician called Stenkil, apparently some distant relation of the king, helped escort these priests back home and helped them and gave mm. them food. And was like, oh, don't, don't be too sad. I'm sure you'll be able to come back soon. You don't want to work in Sweden anyway. Yeah, it's not yeah. nice. Remember this guy Stenkil, as he'll return to the story in future episodes. But this is a good time to mention that Eamon's unnamed daughter is actually married to Stenkil. Apparently, maybe, at this point. So this is why he's appearing in the sources. And uh, we'll remember her uh, existence later in the story. Sometime after this religious intrigue, Eamon sends his son who is confusingly also called Onund, like his uncle, with an army in order to expand the realm. This expedition supposedly crossed the sea and came, according to Adam of Bremen, to Terra Feminarum, or the Land of Women, which is a place where I want to go and visit. Adam places this somewhere in Scythia, but some modern scholars uh, have taken it to mean Kvenland, a part of modern-day Finland, somewhere to the east of the Gulf of Bothnia. The Kven in Kvenland could have been mixed up with the Nordic word kvinna, which means woman. 
I imagine that that would be quite easy for Adam of Bremen to do. Yeah, it's only two letters different and looks very similar and sounds very similar as well. Yeah. So so that is probably what happened, but I like to imagine that they went and explored and came to a land that was only inhabited by women. Yeah, well, and that's what Adam of Bremen wanted to believe because if you uh, continue with the story, our listeners will find out more. So Adam says... Women immediately mixed poison in the spring water and in that way brought death to the king himself and his army. This passage implies that the son of Eamund was also ruling in some way similar to the older Anun did with Ulofhot Kjonung or in some way using Eamund's authority when traveling abroad. But anyway... It does seem to have been a bit of a disaster if Eamon's only mentioned son dies on a raid abroad being poisoned in a land full of women. Yeah, it's quite dramatic. See, this is why we wanted to mention this story, because it's quite, it's quite fun. <laughs> this military failure was either followed or preceded or happened at the same time as a bad drought and several failed harvests. This seems to have happened around 1056. And Adam, of course, says that this was divine vengeance and was actually so great and such a disruption that the Swedes themselves sent envoys to the Archbishop of Bremen asking for Adelvard, the real bishop, to be sent back to Sweden to take up his position at Skara. And the Archbishop joyfully replied that he would send Adelvard, who supposedly converted all of Vermland to Christianity on his journey and was actually eagerly received by the Swedes this time. That's nice. Brilliantly, as we have seen a few times now, Adam also teases us about some lost information. He says that the Archbishop at the time, Adalbert, I can't believe we've got another bishop that's called Bert, is that the only name they had, by the way? Yeah, some of our Twitter listeners will love the appearance of another Bert. <laughs> you, you had to be called something Bert to be a bishop at this time, it seemed. Anyway, Adam writes this. Everything that happened in Sweden in his time, the Lord Archbishop Adelbert described in grandiose language, as was his way. And we don't have that information. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently there's this amazingly dramatic piece of writing. I'm not sure if it's sort of like a bit of a dig or a, a sort of a, a criticism of Adalbert, but I love how it says, as was his as way. As was his way. You know, you, everyone knows Adalbert, you know, always in the hyperbole, always exaggerates stuff. You can't even write a shopping list. It's like two scrumptious apples and a bountiful basket full of wheat or you're something. like Adelbert <laughs> calm down just tell it as it is <laughs> now that is pretty much all we have for the life of Eamond the old slemmy and not good yeah so his son dies on a mission abroad and he likes to employ a fake archbishop <laughs> and that's pretty much it yeah <laughs> There is also a little bit that we know about relations with Denmark, so let's just touch upon that now. Eamond may have continued his brother's support of Danish King Sven against Harald Hardrada. This comes from an early description of the Swedish-Danish border, which has been preserved in later medieval Swedish manuscripts. The text states that Eamund Slemme was king in Uppsala and Sven Forkbeard in Denmark. They placed boundary marks between Sweden and Denmark. They placed six stones between the two kingdoms. The first stone stands in Snutrause, the second in Danabik, the third one is Sinasteen, the fourth is Urksanes, the fifth Vitasteen, the sixth is Brumsesteen between Blekinge and Möre. Now, the historian Peter Sawyer has a lot of information about this. And in older histories, it was usually stated that Blekinge, a province next to Skorna, was given to Denmark by Sweden at this time. This is because a 9th century source states that Blekinge belongs to the Swedes, whilst later medieval sources make clear that it belonged to Denmark. So they're sort of guessing at some mm. point between this time Blekinge changes hands. However, 
scholars like Sawyer have questioned this because there's even doubt if Blekinger was considered Danish in the 1060s, as Adam of Bremen calls the limit of Danish power the province of Skorna. Either way, there's no other contemporary evidence of either Ermund continuing any real support of Sven or any combat involving Swedish forces or any other real interaction led by Ermund. And that's kind of it for Eamund. There's much less to say about him than there was about Arnund. So I think you can see why we decided to just include him in today's episode as well. Yeah, I think it makes sense. And that's it for Olaf Wurkenung's sons. And uh, yeah, there's no other sons to come because they're all dead. Yeah. So we'll see what happens next time and how we continue the story of the Swedish kings. Uh, I think we're going to cover quite a lot in the next episode. Uh, so be prepared for lots of names, lots of death and unknown endings and beginnings of stories. Are there more Berts to come? I don't think so, actually. I'm not sure. Um, we'll see, see if more Berts crop up. Yes. But yeah, before we get to uh, next week, we yep. have two new reviews to read out. Uh, Lovely for this reviews. One. Yes, to add to the one we read out last time. Would you like to read these two? Yeah, well, the first one, this is again reviews posted on the US page of iTunes. The first one, five stars from Vegan Skywalker, who writes interesting content with good perspective and tone. Thanks. Well, thank you, Vegan Skywalker. Yeah. May the force be with you. And then the next one? The next one, also five stars. Great information by Mrs. Viro or Viro. As an American looking to move to Sweden, understanding the history has been super helpful. Thanks to you both. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, those have been on there for quite a while by the time uh, you listen to this episode. So I hope uh, you don't mind yeah. it being a bit of a delay for us reading them out. But uh, it's because we record so far in advance sometimes that uh, by the time they actually get read out, uh, it's not necessarily very up to date. And also, if, if Mrs. Vero is still looking to move to Sweden, I hope you do. And if you do, I hope you get very happy here. Yes. And before we go, we asked in our anniversary episode, uh, a couple of episodes ago, if people had found us right at the beginning when we only had one episode released and if they were still listening now. And we have. There are some people that have been with us uh, from the start and that's great. Yeah, we had uh, Kate on facebook who said uh, happy birthday i've been listening from the very first episode and haven't missed a single one yet thanks for your work oh thank you kate for listening and we've had jim on facebook one of our regular contacty people yeah always good to hear from you jim yeah and jim said he found us around episode six or seven so he's probably at the moment he's yeah. the second longest listener yeah. who's still with us very much from the start well and i'm sure there are more uh, of you out there that might just no, I've gotten in touch and we really appreciate each and every one of you. Yes. And we've also had, talking of the recent special episode we had, uh, we actually had a, an email uh, from Steve, a fellow Brit in Sweden, uh, talking about our first special episode uh, about the dog tags. And he knows a couple of Swedish friends here in Sweden who do remember getting their civilian dog tags. So you're not the only oh, one. Oh, that's so, so good to hear. That <laughs> I was starting to think that maybe the Swedish authorities just sent one out to me. Yeah, created but... a whole national campaign and spent billions of crew on this thing that only you you no got. No one else seemed to have them or remember them. But you know, Steve got in touch and he, like you said, he says that he has Swedish friends that uh, that have dog tags. So that was great to hear. And uh, he also wrote some more. Yeah, he um, uh, gave a bit of his life story. He served in the British Army for nine years. And when he served, he also had to wear dog tags on his feet, uh, on one of his feet. So he had one round his neck and one round his feet. Just in case it's more chances of the dog tags being recovered if you uh, got a not so uh, nice end to your time in the military. So that was very interesting to know. And uh, yeah, please do send more stories about anything that we cover. Yeah. But if you have any examples or fun things you'd like to mention or add or just comment on, do uh, send us an email or leave us a review. Maybe send us a photo of uh, your Fredas Mus if you got up to anything uh, cozy. cozy and nice on a, on a Friday following some Swedish Fredas Mus. 
Yeah, Beatrice on Twitter has tweeted us a great picture of the puzzle that she's doing. A puzzle from an old map of Norway and Sweden. So there's some fun stuff going on out there um, at the moment. Whilst us all in Sweden are stuck inside uh, with snow and corona and everything going on. So it's it's a good time to have not just Freydag's moose, but whole week moose. A moose every, uh, every evening, yeah. Until next time, it's uh, bye-bye from us. Hey, Dor.